with me. I remember when I was started to approach Mr. Hines or Gregory Hines, I got, you know, like antsy and giddy, like, oh my God, this is a movie star. And I was like, no, no, mm-hmm. just talk to the man as a man. And that's what I did. Just staying that calm and the one-on-one of what my intentions are. I recognize who you are. And then just based on that, he can just say yes, or he didn't have to walk me down the street to give me a private moment. He can be like, I'm busy, kid. You don't buy it. Mm-hmm. But he was genuine. And therefore, being genuine, I have to do that to anyone that I approach or, or am within their circle of whatever it is. Just being pure and genuine because you don't know how you're going to affect them. You don't know why they're asking. Or it doesn't matter. Just be genuine. You know, it gets you so much further. What's up? This is Rebel Radio. What up, what up? This is DJ Newmark. This is Peanut Butter Wolf. It's your boy. It's okay. Keep checking out Rebel Radio. Rebel Radio. This is Rebel Radio. We're in the place right here. Uh-huh. Rebel Radio is going down. Would you say Rebel Radio? Oh, wait. Let's do it again. Rebel Radio. What's up, Rebels? Welcome back to Rebel Radio, the weekly show where I bring you the Rebels who are shaping our culture. I'm your host, Josh Levine, and today my guest is T. Eric Monroe. He's a photographer documenting hip hop and skate culture for many, many years, shooting folks like Wu Tang, Nas, Fuji's, Fat Joe, the list goes on and on. Eric has a beautiful three volume set called Rare and Unseen Moments of 90s Hip Hop. Uh, Coffee table books, great if you need a gift, if you need uh, something for your house, check it out. Eric's also got uh, the T Eric Genesis Collection new NFT set. Uh, we'll post the, the his URL in the show notes, and you can go check it out and maybe buy one for yourself. Eric's got some great stories, uh, folks he's met along the way, lessons learned, um, some of the differences between what it means to document a culture from the inside as a participant versus just on the outside looking in. And, uh, and I love this one about how just kind of going with the flow can lead you to memorable moments and experiences. Sometimes you got to just roll with it. And uh, he's got some great examples of that. So let's get into it right now with T. Eric Monroe. No, no, thanks for doing this, man. I'm excited. I'm, you know, I've been seeing your name and following your work for years. And, uh, you know, I know Cove put us together. Right on, yeah. Shout out to Synapse. Uh, he's, 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 he's a golden child because he just yeah, for gets sure. such a beautiful network, uh, kind of like I do, um, across such... Um, mixtures of, of cultures absolutely yes um like i said i've you know i've seen your work i think you mentioned you shot the roots cover when i was at herb um, well i didn't i don't think i shot the cover i definitely know i was in the magazine i have to see the cover again but i remember there's two shots uh at least that were in there uh from 1994 of the roots oh okay and come nice. to find out the day that i shot that quest love let me know that was the day before they went to, or that was the last day in the United States before they did their pilgrimage to London and to Europe uh, in 94. So that wow. was interesting. It was their last day in the States. That's big. Yeah. That's big. So um, how do those things fit together? The, you know, the marketing, you know, experiential stuff you were doing and your background in photography. What's it, it the... All, it, to me, it all makes sense because of, uh, I think part of it is become, coming up as a skater uh, and also always taking pictures, um, not necessarily from the angle of always being the photographer, but you just see things as they're coming. Like when you're skating, you see a possible trick you can do. Like, you know, you just got to ollie up, do certain mm-hmm. things, move and pivot, and then you keep trying. Um, as it relates to, you know, hip hop, exponential marketing, photography, and even storytelling now through books, I see what I went through. I see how simple it was. Uh, yes, there was hurdles to get through certain places or certain things, but you always knew you can possibly do it and you have to do it with blind faith because back in the 90s, when you shot on film, you didn't see your work until maybe two hours or two days later. Sure. You know, so you had to fully trust your gut. You know, So yeah. with trusting your gut and understanding people and relationships and situations and what kind of outcomes we'd like to have happen, um, you just apply the same thing in event marketing because you're dealing with people and you're creating a moment for the client, you know, that's memorable and special and helps tell their brand story. Uh, I just see it so similar, you know, and I love uh, photography now um, because I understand the fullness of what an image can do or capturing a moment can do not necessarily to sell it as fine art, but to share it with someone in their family because they didn't see it that way. And it's, and it's the most simple, pure form. That's what I really enjoy about the storytelling of utilizing photography. I mean, that's really interesting. And I think about, you know, you talk about trusting your gut. I think so much about the the age we live in with technology is about 
removing our gut from from you know so yeah. many decisions we have to make. Absolutely. Right? Um, and uh, so so how do you how do you continue to challenge yourself to do that when sometimes you don't have to? You can look on the back of the you know the viewfinder, right? See see immediately if a shot's working or it isn't. It, it's funny because. <laughs> For me, uh, I trust my gut first. Let's say, for example, I'm looking at something I'm like, oh, that's going to be a cool image. I really look at it and study what it is I'm, I'm trying to capture within that frame. Like, am I trying to accent a person, a tree? If I'm trying to tell a story of two different things that are in the space, but can tell their own different story. That's why it caught my attention. And I want someone else to be able to see it. It's sort of like that. Um, right. But you have to trust your gut because even if you just throw your camera up there or your phone and just snap a picture, sure you got something, you got something, but what did you really get? Like, but trusting your gut and slowing down, you know, to almost analog and just going back to the basics of taking your time, focusing on the moment, and then deciding to take a picture because in film you only have 36 frames or moments to capture. You know, so it's going back to that slow, methodical way of approaching a situation because that's what allowed me to have a you know a successful photography and. I, and even journalism career now that I look back at it because I started writing and doing photography for Thrasher and then I just mm -hmm. went to just doing photography. Cool. That's great. So, okay. I want to, I want to dig into some of that, but take me back to the very beginning. Um, you, so let's talk about your, your journey with music. Do you remember the first record you ever bought for yourself? Yes. Um, I was either, I feel, well, first two records I remember one is, uh, disco duck um it was like this <laughs> Disney cartoon thing um i think that was like when i was in kindergarten and i didn't understand vinyl and i remember specifically that i took the record to school and i remember when i was going to bring it home i wanted to put it in my backpack and i remember i folded it and i remember <laughs> hearing the sound. i'm like what the fuck is that but i remember like, yep. was like oh you can't do that and then the second record i purchased uh was rapper's delight and that was in, i want to say i was in second grade or something like that i'm that old um but those are the first two records that i bought and it was just based on fun you know, and then because my, my ear was just open to radio played everything back then. So you heard, you know, everything from classic rock to, you know, uh, cool in the gang. Um, just it was just music. And that's what I was raised on in music. And my environment that I grew up in was a suburban environment. So I had mixed cultures of people around me all the time. You know, I did everything from Boy Scouts to, uh, you know, go to church and church activities to playing football and then eventually getting into skateboarding. So it had a very, uh, I had a fun didn't grow up in the city environment that that's why I am so intrigued by the city or city life because I don't live in it but I can see and appreciate uh what's there and I understand what people think are relevant and being able to capture those relevant moments to share uh, those moments with other people so that's that's where my background comes from so you know you talk about that time like skating was very much an inner city thing at the time you right. know I, I I think you know for the most part I don't think I think of skate skating is you know it didn't really get to the suburbs and until a little bit later although you know with exceptions obviously mm -hmm. um you know what how do, how do you think that early experience i mean that is it's definitely outsider culture um, right how did that experience kind of shape the rest of your path amazingly um skateboarding for me uh i went to you know very mixed mixed high school and i think i was the only black skater at the school Mm -hmm. um initially i was only black skating since like 1987 and i got introduced to skateboarding because some kids at my lunch table just started skateboarding and they're you know i watched them like this looks like fun let me try it and, and that's mm -hmm. literally how it started then by that summer uh it was the 1987 uh pal pearl to bones brigade demo and they came here to new jersey uh mm -hmm. and to edison and at that time a mike valley or mike valley uh, lived in Edison and he was still an amateur for Powell Peralta. So being going to demos like that and seeing, you know, your local hero now a celebrity amongst, you know, Tommy Guerrero, uh, Mike McGill, um, all of these big names of 1987, 1980 in skateboarding. So just seeing that, seeing the environment, all the kids around me, this new environment just opened me up to so much more because skaters introduced me to more kinds of music, to more kinds of culture, to more kinds of food, to more kinds of just outside thinking. Um, and I think that really helped navigate me um, because I still was the same kid who still wanted to take a picture when he took a picture or still play football or being in the marching band or even being in musical theater. It was just a part of the, that culture of doing more and more to experiment and, and experience more of life rather than just sitting in this one little solid box saying, I'm just going to be hip hop. 
Yeah, I mean, that's so interesting. And I think of, you know, I think there's so many parallels, you know, between hip hop and skating, um, including where they are now, right? Where And, and I Absolutely. think, you know, in some ways, I mean, I know skating is now in the Olympics, right? And, and like, wild. it is wild. I think it's really interesting when, you know, how can I say it? Like, in some ways, skating has just become a sport. Right. And in some ways, hip hop has just become music. Right. And, you know, on the one hand, like, I think it loses something in that process, right? From being. It definitely creates kind of a dividing line. Right. It definitely creates a dividing line. It's kind of, it's, uh, it's like the purest versus the people don't care about the purity of it. They just want to do it right. to do it where the purists are like, oh no, it can't do this. You can't. And that was the same thing when skateboarding was going into the Olympics and you had the purists within the skateboard community say why it shouldn't be in there. But if it's going to be right. in there, these are the certain things that us purists will allow for or keep the standard of skateboarding where it should be. It's the same thing with hip hop. Um, and it's interesting that you say, or see the same parallels that I did uh, of how skateboarding and, um, hip hop specifically were so similar. And I remember uh, when I was in junior college after high school, and it's probably the only A I ever got, I wrote a sociology paper comparing Steve Rocco, who old, owned World Industries and his genius mm -hmm. to Russell Simmons genius. And I got an A on the paper wow. just because I made the exact, I mean, they were part, sure. like, I saw it clear, clear as night and day because Russell didn't, Russell understood hip hop or what it could be and the potential of it in the youth. And people were like, you're crazy, but he ran with the ball. Steve Rocco did the same thing where he was working for the, the corporates and he was like, F this, mm -hmm. I see a different way of doing it. Everyone saw it with him, you know, and he got the right financing and he just took off, if you would, and just created a whole different world, you know, yeah. in uh, street skateboarding. Absolutely. Um, so how'd you get started taking pictures? So, uh, since I was a kid, I've always had a camera in the house and somehow I became, not the default photographer, but I always felt comfortable taking family moments, whether it was you know, a holiday, uh, relatives visiting on a fishing trip. So it was just always taking a picture here, taking a picture there and just cataloging life itself, if you would. Um, mm -hmm. And then come to find out later, if, when I look back at things, it's interesting that um, if when I look through it like a family catalog or a family album, which aren't, don't really exist much anymore, but back in the day they did. But it was something about the person that always took the pictures in your family album they were able to take a picture without having to label anything. So you knew exactly what you were looking at at all times. So somehow that methodology of being so focused on a moment, you know, kept going as I was going to skateboard demos or going to concerts or sneaking in here and shoot. So, it, and, then it, and then at some point learning from the photo labs in New York City, like the, how I should really, really be honing in my skills. And here's what, you know, major photographers are doing. So that was my big lesson. And speeding up uh, my professionalism was by learning from the lab technicians what other people were doing or trying and experimenting and applying the way I also saw moments. So that really helped uh, the learning process or learning curve to get into the professional world. You know, it's so funny. I mean, and I know a lot of people listening are kind of our, our age group. So maybe it's, maybe it's not as shocking as I think it is, but like, you know, I, I studied photography in, in high school a little bit. I didn't take it very seriously, but it was so much work to be yes. a photographer, right? The, the hours you had to spend in the dark room, the money, trying to get the, the equipment, the, you know, the chemicals. Yep. It was, I mean, I, I enjoyed it. Um, and and I'm, you must have too, but like, it's so much work compared to now. Right, you where know, you can just go click and it's done, yeah. But yeah, it, it, you, with, you know. Having, yeah, getting your hands dirty it, within the process of it, helps you sure. to not only appreciate what you photographed, but it makes you more mindful of the next picture that you take because you know you don't want it to be too bright or too dark or what caused it to be this color hue shift. It, it teaches yeah. you about what it is that you're actually doing in the moment. So once you get in the dark room, you're already thinking from a dark room perspective how you want your image to come out. Because even now, you know, with using my iPhone and taking moments, I'm already developing the picture in my head of like, okay, yeah, this is too much, you know, yellow in the mm -hmm. picture right now, but I know, you know, once I go into Lightroom, I can reduce the yellow, or I can bring this up, I can drop that back, but it's all, like right. you said, like you're in the dark room with the chemicals, but in your head now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So, okay, so how did it go from hobby to, to becoming your, your career path? Um, 
that would be, in 1990, it was in 1992, it was a defining moment of when it went into the professional world. I was at a, um, an event in New Jersey, uh, for, it was the MTV Beach Bash, and they had a mm-hmm. skateboarding area, and then they had a, a hip-hop performance with Criss mm-hmm. Cross and Das Effect. So I was there for skating, and I ended okay. up working with the person who was coordinating to get a photo pass for the stage, because I just wanted to see the show. Brought my camera, shot the show, after the show, went backstage, and, and a photographer asked me, hey, what are you going to do with your pictures from the show? And I didn't have an answer for him. And I was just like, you know, just show them to my friends. He's like, why don't you try and sell them? And I didn't know that was a possibility. And he broke it down for me. And I, I finally, I, I realized I was like, oh shit. So he literally gave me a list of 10 places to call. By the 10th place, someone wanted to see it. And that started the momentum in the professional world of how you can network and sell your, your photography uh, to magazines or license it out. But what I forgot prior to that, my first published picture was in 1988 as a junior in high school. I was at a skateboarding event and I photographed the first woman to ever skate at the Brooklyn Banks. We sent it to Thrasher. Thrasher published it in 1988. So that was my first picture, color picture published in Thrasher magazine. And then I got a few more skateboarding pictures published while I was in high school. But I didn't, it's not that I didn't take it seriously. I just didn't see, I didn't know what the possibilities were. It was pure fun. And the, you know, the magazine kept publishing my work. So speed up to 1992, when I started working with the photo agency, the first thing they said was, you need to get a magazine behind you. And I'm like, only magazine I know is Thrasher. So I literally called up Thrasher, talked to Kevin uh, Thatcher. He put me in touch with Brian Brendan, the music um, the music uh, director, if you would, for Thrasher magazine. And he broke it down. He's like, whatever you want to sh- you know, write an article or something, set it up, we'll work with you to set it up, write the article to go against it, and we'll publish it because they had no writers or photographers in terms of music right. in New York. They had guys that would you know fly in and out to shoot some skate stuff, but that was about it. But that just gave me an open door uh, because it was a skateboard magazine to allow me in the doors of hip hop or whatever um, area of music who the publicists would pay attention to. But I found the publicists were leaning on me to try and get stuff into Thrasher because that, that in their you know weekly marketing meeting, they can say, hey, well, we got an article of Nas in Thrasher magazine. We got an article of this person. Mm-hmm. And it was a big torch to carry, you know, versus, OK, we got it in the source, this hip hop magazine. Right. It, it helped it work both sides of, of the game for me helping them and them helping me. So it, it's also just taking the initiative of really learning once your foot is in the door, how to keep moving within the building that you're in. And then also reaching back out to bring someone else in the fold. Man, that's such a big one. Uh, you know, I think definitely in my own career, you know, I've had uh, so much success by just finding any way I can to get in the door and right. then just never leaving. That's and, it. And, uh, you know, they have to escort me out if they, if they want to be good. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's so interesting. So so how, tell me more about that. How is that, you know, g- give me an example of kind of how that's played out for you. Um, in many ways. Um, I remember when I realized I wasn't the best writer and there was a guy who worked at the skate shop. He, he was funny, he was smart. And I think he, he was already writing. And I said to him, um, dude, I'm working for Thrasher. I'm, you know, getting all stuff done. I said, but I know you're a better writer than me. I said, just start coming with me to these things. You do the interview, you write the article, I'll shoot it. And we'll just get, keep going. The kid ended up being Chris Naracco, who we all know, who writes for everyone and does commentary on television. But that was that genuine knowing of this person is so much better at this skill set than I am, that mm-hmm. it got the ball rolling of his professional writing career. You know, and then since then, we've done so many projects together, even this past March. He brought me in uh, to be a part of the NJ Brick Vans collection that was released back in March with Redman in it. You know, so nice. we're still friends and we're always reaching out to the next person next to us. Where we're like, dude, you have this talent. Don't give up. Here's an opportunity. You know, and like just showing people like this real world, this real world of opportunity does exist. And it's not just on Instagram. I mean, I think that's so huge. You know, I, I, I you know, I hate to keep coming back to myself, but I but I also, you know, it just really resonates with me because. For me, doing favors is a way of life. And, totally. you know, trying, like you said, trying to pull in people, you know, behind you, um, you know, and I had a similar, you know, I was writing for The Source, which I only got because they needed somebody on the West Coast because the West Coast was blowing up and Paul Stewart right. just graduated to be a, a huge manager and whoever else was writing out here. So they needed somebody and I happen to know someone who knew John Schechter and, you know, and, oh, right on. Me Shit, in. Yes. and so I was writing for them. And then like, you know, then I had, I got an assignment to go uh, write a story about Warren G and they were like, Hey, wow. if you, if you have somebody that takes pictures, we have 500 bucks for, for a photo. 
So I called Brent Rollins, who was, you know, we right had in college together. And I was like, Brent, get your camera. Like, let's go do this. And oh. then, you know, and then I ended up telling, uh, you know, John, like, hey, you should really need Sasha Jenkins. You should really need Elliot Wilson. Uh, you that know, was a whole really, yeah. Right? And those guys go on to do big things. And, like, it's not, it's you know. Amazing. It's, but that's like a, I don't know. Like, to me, that's such a small thing, but it's so important. Right, right. And it's funny you, know, you mentioned all those names. And I felt like that was my graduating class of, you know, going from freelance to really setting sure. your own flag in the sand, if you would, you know, because I remember watching them when they first started Ego Trip. And I remember when, when I think it was Sasha that told me the name Ego Trip. And I, I, I didn't get it because I'm not as smart as they are in terms of like wizardry. Because um, the first thing I thought, I'm like, why are you using De La Soul's Ego Trip song? Like, because I like De La Soul. And that's how I said it in right. my head. Right. But they had such a, a very strategic vision of where they wanted to go that you see it now, you're just like, yeah exactly so we're all on the same trajectory of helping people and growing our ideas and our brands if you would absolutely but also giving back and giving new opportunities to others yeah no that's that's a big one um how does how does it so so now like anybody can take a picture of a skater you know i can go down to the tennis bowl with my phone take pictures what What's different about the way you shoot something as an insider to the culture than, you know, a casual observer who's just looking at imagery from the outside? Um, I, I, in terms of, I'll use skateboarding as an easy example for me anyway. Be, when, because you skate, you understand how the body mechanics are going to move. You understand how the board is going to flip at a certain point. And you always want to line it up. So if someone's looking at the picture, in my mind, they know what the trick that the person is doing based mm. on how the board is rotating, how the person's body is twisting and what the, or how their body's about to catch the board to finish the move. So it's a matter of being right in the middle of knowing when to capture that moment to tell the story without a caption, that kind of thing. That's how, uh, from the inside perspective out. And even when I shoot, you know, like, uh, like recently I started, uh, videotaping a lot of rappers uh, behind the scenes and catch, catching moments of them and their friends and really watching what it is, they're, how they're engaged with one another and then capturing a moment where it places the viewer right by the person or right within the joke of whatever's happening at the moment. So it's like giving people that because even uh, I think last week I posted on Instagram um, uh, most stuff looking at my volume two book and we're just having a casual conversation like we're old friends in 1985 like that's where it brought you like no one ever gets to get in most deaf space like that and be so casual where he's not as guarded you know so it's just giving you that inside feel and understanding of when the right moment's the right moment to capture it and what to share and when because you also have to keep the privacy respect factor of the artist if you would in order to sure able you to continue to stay within that uh, privacy zone yeah that's such a big point and i think you know the great photographers um they create an intimacy with their subjects right that uh, that you know and a lot of times you know you get an assignment you're meeting somebody for the first time they're they're you know celebrities especially they're guarded there's that's part of right. their job or you know models right they're only trying to show you their their good side so to speak um, totally. So te- teach me, teach everybody listening. How, how do you how do you create that comfort, that intimacy with a stranger in when when you know in a matter of minutes? Um. Hmm. I mean, it's so natural for me. Uh, I can I can answer like this. Um, a lot of the subjects that I shot during the '90s, they didn't they weren't a big name yet. They like Nas had a name, but it didn't resonate mm-hmm. yet. You know, right. Wu-Tang guys had a name, but it, they weren't ringing off yet. It was like, they're starting their sure. solo projects. So you're purely, depending on how you approach the one-on-one of, hi, my name is Eric. Oh, nice to meet you. You know, so-and-so rapper. Once you get past the original hi, 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 they're used to being thrown in a set. Give me the yo, yo, yo. Give me the finger. Give there's a routine that they're used to. Mm-hmm. I don't like the sure. routine because it's insulting. Like, why would you, are you asking me to act like someone else? You know, it's like giving De La Soul, you know, a bunch of daisies and say, oh, it's a daisy age, take a picture. And it's just like, well, fuck it, really? It's approaching a person just being genuine and waiting for them to feel comfortable around you before even raising a camera. You know, whether it's mm. taking a walk around the block, whether you talk to the person or not, just finding that and waiting for that moment of 
where the guard goes down, where they're comfortable, where you see where they're not trying to be the guarded character MC, but you get the real, uh, you know, government name of the person. You really get to a real feel and sense for them. Um, because even in my first few shots, I use, uh, sorry, um, cancel decline. That's okay. Sorry about that. Um, oh, sorry. I can use an example of like Raekwon and Ghostface. Um, when I first met them, I didn't really know who they were. And, it, and, and their, their energy was bouncing off of each other. Like that's their, mm-hmm. their freaking frag. It's like Red Man and Method Man and being around that mm-hmm. energy. So first getting them to, to get in a space of just looking at and watching them. And they're doing the typical hip hop things. But once they exhaust all their hip hop poses, that's when they breathe and relax. And then that's when you step back and, and, and capture what it is you're observing. And then you sort of, it's like a dance. Like you see their momentum or movement of how they're, they feel comfortable moving. If they want to move to the left or to the right, it's like a dance. You let them move. And then you're, you have a different angle of perspective and even lighting to start viewing them from different angles, but just keeping that comfort level of, and also knowing when the moment's done, like you, you can't overstretch that moment. Right. That's big. And I, and I think, um, you know, a lot of people uh, in, in all walks of life, I know we're talking about photography, but, but, you know, in any setting, you know, what's interesting is, so, you know, these, you, you're talking about, you know, famous people, influential people, uh, you know, by, by some definition, powerful people, but yes, it's your shoot, you're in charge. Right. right. And, and your, your job is. Well, I, I disagree with, with, with a small percentage. Okay. I disagree. Cause disagree. I feel like, I, I, the only reason I say like this is because I, even though it is your shoot, it's, I, I didn't, for the most part, a lot of my work was not shot in a static studio. It was either on the street, on the scene, at someone's house. So you're always in their environment. So they control the space. You're a guest in their space. Even when, you know, it's a studio shoot, like even though it would be my studio, my, you still have to allow your subject to feel as comfortable as possible um to even want to be there and then be open enough and free enough to allow you in their private guarded space yeah i guess i i don't think we're disagreeing i think what i mean is uh and it's okay if we are um but but you know i i think like you're there to do a job to get the shot to tell the story right and that's whether they've hired you or someone's hired you or you're doing it for yourself right and you know at the end of that you know even even the artist but certainly the viewer is going to re- recognize whether you got the job done or not correct and so you know it's it's not a, when i say in charge it's not like you versus them gotcha. but it's that you know i think we sometimes have a tendency to place ourselves in a sort of hierarchy with somebody else and say well either they're leading or i'm leading and and right. the reality is you both have a role to play. And if you just leave Correct. it up to, you know, to your subject to just do whatever they want, well, they're not photographers. If they were, they would, they wouldn't need you. Right. Right. Um, and, Correct. And, and so that's where I think it's interesting. And, and I think sometimes people get intimidated or they get, they get confused about that role um, where, you know, it, it, that, you know, where, where it's a dance. Right. Yes. Every, everyone has to has to do their part. Um, thinking of that, who's who's been the most fun person to shoot? Um, I'd have to say Fat Joe. Um, and I say that because the first time I photographed him was in 1993. I didn't really know who he was. Uh, mm-hmm. By 1994, I ended up um, the source asked me to go up to the South Bronx. And I think it was 1994. And I had to go up to the South Bronx and finished capturing some graffiti that Fat Joe had just done. Um, and I remember taking the subway up there. I didn't know, you know the myth about the South Bronx and being bad. And I remember Joe met me at the subway station, um, took me around, we shot we need to shoot, kicked it for a bit. And then he drove me back to the subway station and said to me, he's like, hey, it's like, be careful, it's crazy out here. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, I didn't say, I was like, all right, cool. I didn't think about how dangerous <laughs> the South Bronx was, but it was sure. a genuine moment. And then, you know, reconnecting with him over time, you know, uh, when he started the terror squad and had me, you know, go up to Pun's house and photograph that. And just these random, just fun moments that were just pure and genuine. Um, and that's always been my relationship to Fat Joe. And then even last January, where they had the Loud Records uh, reunion, mm-hmm. I ended up going and uh, I ended up going into Joe's dressing room and we hadn't seen each other in years. And I see him peek 
And he, like, he was shocked to see me. So after a while, I finally made way off his, after all of his guests left. And he was just elated to see me. He was just like, yo. And we just went back to like 1994. Like we're kids just hanging out on the street again. You know, and it, it was yeah. that genuine pure friendship that I know that exists, you know, even though the celebrity is there, but it reminds you like you're, you're doing something right. Like just keep going and staying who you are to be, to be true to who you are, because that's what allows so, so many magical things to happen over time, just by being um, genuine. No, that's great. Um, I, I know, you know, Stefan Oreo told me a story about getting to shoot his idols, uh, De Niro and Pacino, and it wow. went horribly wrong. No. And, uh, there's a happy ending to that story. He worked it out and, and you know, uh, but uh, but it was it was hard. It was it was a hard moment where he, he felt like he had kind of let himself down and right. you know had to had to work his way out of it. Um, when does that happen for you? What's been the, the toughest shoot or or when you've you know you you weren't able to go do what you came to do and how'd you What'd you learn from it? Um, oh, oh, I know. Um, going back to the um, Criss Cross show in 1992. So the agency that um, you know reached out to went to show my work. I hadn't gotten my film developed yet. So I got the film developed and there's like two good shots out of, you know, 36 shots. And mm -hmm. the person was just like, okay, this is okay, but we'll give you another chance. And I'm like, I didn't know what that meant. Meaning that they were gonna allow me another opportunity to photograph someone to see if my work was up to snuff. So I said, okay, cool. So the following weekend, uh, they arranged for me to shoot Arrested Development while they were uh, in, on tour. So I got to the venue early, got some great outdoor shots of Arrested Development, got some uh, shots of them uh, in concert. And then on my way out, I found a flyer for a hip hop showcase that was happening the next day with Onyx and Maceo of De La Soul. So the oh, next wow. day I'd go back in the city, um, get ready for the showcase, standing out in front of this theater and across the street uh, was the Broadway show Jelly's Last Jams featuring Gregory Hines. So at the time, uh, the actors were coming out from the stage door signing playbills. I ended up getting out of my car with my camera. And then as I'm approaching the walk or the stage door, Gregory Hines walks out and, you know, he's signing autographs. And I say to him, Mr. Hines, do you mind if I take your picture? I just want to put a portfolio together. Some line I said, he's like, yeah, sure, no problem. Sign, sign, sign. And then he goes, stop. And I'm like, Oh shit, what I do? He looks at me, he's like, You want to take pictures? I was like, Yeah, he's like, let's go. He's like, You guys stay here. And he walks me down the block and he goes, Go for it. And I shot oh, 12 wow. frames of him. And we're walking back. And he's like, Do you have a card? And for some reason I already had him a business card. I gave it to him. He's like, You guys wait. He walks me back into the stage door, introduces me to the stage manager. Like, this is Eric. He's gonna come back with pictures for me. Let him in whenever he comes back. We walked back oh, outside wow. and then shook hands or whatever, went across the street, shot Onyx and uh Maceo, Michelle and they go cello drop all the film off. The next day I go back to New York to the agency. I present everything that I shot for the weekend. The person looks at it. She's like, how, not even the rest of the month. She's like, how in the fuck did you shoot Gregory Hines? How in the fuck did you do that? I was like, is that not normal? <laughs> I didn't know the difference. <laughs> but that, that was a moment where I had fucked up shots that almost didn't get me in the door. But then I rebounded with, wow. you know, the gifts of the universe, you know, by just asking someone, can I just take your picture? Yeah, that's great. What an amazing yeah. experience. Um, what what'd you learn from that? What do you what do you use from that experience today? Just to slow down. No, uh, actually, exactly what it, it showed me. I remember when I was started to approach Mr. Hines or Gregory Hines, I got you know like antsy and giddy, like oh my god, this movie star. And I was like, no, no, just mm -hmm. talk to the man as a man, and that's what I did. Just staying that calm and the one on one of what my intentions are. I recognize who you are, and then just based on that. He can just say yes, or he didn't have to walk me down the street to give me a private moment. He can be like, I'm busy, kid. You don't buy it. Mm -hmm. But he was genuine. And therefore, being genuine, I have to do that to anyone that I approach or, or am within their circle of whatever it is. Just being pure and genuine because you don't know how you're going to affect them. You don't know why they're asking. Or it doesn't matter. Just be genuine. You know, it gets you so much further. Yeah, that's great. Uh, let's talk about the book. Uh, yes. Rare and Unseen Moments of 90s Hip Hop. Is it, is it three volumes? Three volumes, volume one, two, and three. And then we also have nice. the collector's edition bold book, uh, which oh, is cool. a combination of the three volumes plus bonus material. And it's a high, you know, it's a fine art book, the way that it was made, um, handcrafted. It's it's gorgeous. Um, but it, it was a, a project that I was really, really 
looking forward to doing it. My business partner who actually laid out the, and designed the book and really coached me every step of the way of how we can really do a book. Um, I'm so grateful for it because right, working on the book allowed me to get my writing chops really up to snuff because I worked with another writer. I worked with a copy editor and they would ask me about the stories or the moments that I'm describing in the book. And it helped me really pull these moments out to articulate what it is about being around the person. What was the lead up moment to that actual photograph, you know, moment shot. Um, and then just things about it. So it, it opened me up to be able to share the books. And I remember um, one person said to me, um, you know, I read these books to my daughter at night. And I was like, wow, really? And I'm like, yeah, I think of it now. I'm like, it's, P it's a PG book, you know, it's, sure. it, and it's generational, you know, because it's not just this one little area of hip hop, you know, it just mm -hmm. tells an interesting story, essay by essay. And it's not based on this happened then. It's just each book is a mixture of different moments that, that really fit together right, you know, and there's a lot more material um, that I still am digitizing now that I'm sharing on social media, but the books have been a fun, um, tool to really connect with people yeah that's cool you know obviously for those of us who lived through 90s hip-hop you know it was such a special time in music and culture and the, the community that you know formed around it you know i'm always amazed you see all these documentaries coming out now and it's like for me what you know part of what's so amazing is like it was really a small group of people you know, right. a few hundred people or something who were building something that would, you know, change the shape of the world. Um, totally. What is if, you know, for people that, that uh, you know, are coming up now that, you know, miss that, that don't know the history, um, you know, they might like the music, but they don't, they don't know all the stories behind it. What, what are you hoping right. that gets passed down? Hey, really great and interesting perspective of what the what the 90s were about um i think between my body of work there's other photographers out there who have great bodies of work but just haven't shared it but in knowing there's more storytelling about the 90s that's available to to do i think it's my job or mission in so many ways um not just to be the guy of the 90s hip-hop photography but also encouraging other people who have this material, who photographed this, photographed that, but they just threw it in their attic and they went on to do a career to get it back out, put it in the hands of lovers, of the people who are interested or donate it to a library and have them digitize it and make it available, you know, to the general public, if you would. But it, there's so much more of the 90s that, you know, like it got into a few magazines and the magazines got turned into documents, but what else happened? You know, like there's so many more stories to tell. Um, a great example or a simple example of that is, in 1995, uh, the Wu-Tang did a free show called Park Hill Day. And my experience of Park Hill Day and photographing it and what I thought was a beautiful, beautiful afternoon, come to find out there was a segment of the afternoon or the evening where I was backstage or somewhere, but then like a fight broke out or something happened and then cops came everywhere and cleaned up the streets. And I remember coming back out and the streets were clear. I'm like, huh, that was weird. Maybe the concert was over. But my friend who was in the front had a different perspective of this happened, photograph this happened. So you, you, there's more perspectives that people can learn from, you know, and, and sort of like, you know, the 95 Source Awards kind of thing, you know, where crazy yeah. shit happened. But what wasn't told was, you know, less than a month later, Dr. Dre was at, you know, Puffy's birthday party. And, uh, you know, a month mm -hmm. later, Snoop was in Philadelphia at the same concert with Biggie, you know, filming for the show, the movie. Like, why aren't those stories told? There was no beef that they're all in the same building together, making right. money together. You know, that could have stopped some of the negative BS that's still being broadcast, you know, out there about, oh, the 90s hip hop. And, sure. No, let's just, let's give people more respect, you know, for their life, if they, especially if they passed, you know. Um, for me, a, a moment of respect, a really great understanding was uh, a couple of years ago, I finally met Little Caesar or introduced myself to Little Caesar. And I have one picture of him. It's him, Tupac, B Biggie together, all wearing on a bad boy T-shirt. That was shot in 1993. And I didn't even know who those guys were. I was photographing Onyx for a piece for Thrasher magazine. Uh, mm -hmm. at what, I forgot what venue it was. But literally, when I finished shooting Onyx, they yelled to me, come take our picture. And I said, sure. And I went over, looked at them, gave them the due diligence and respect. And I took one picture of them and said, thank you, and went back to the dressing room. And for years, I didn't even look at that slide again because it was a big middle finger in it. You know, yeah. I just wrote Tupac something finger on it, you know, but it's just giving people genuine moments. But where I was going with Little Caesar, Caesar said to me, and I happened to have the picture the same day, he's like, You're, this is the only moment that I have to show our friendship with, with Tupac and how genuine it was. He's like, in this picture, I was 13 years old. I shouldn't even been in a club. 
And I was oh, like, wow. wow, like purely of being able to hear him say how they were friends, you know, and yeah. it just, just demystifies all these documentaries that are just making money off, off bloodshed, you know, in, in so many ways. Yeah. I mean, that's what I love about it. And, and these books, you know, like I'm yours, I'm sure like that, you know, give more of the context and the, and the nuance, right. Which gets lost in a lot right. of this. And, you know, of course there was beef. We know that we know it's a part of the culture and it's a part of the business. Right. It was also manipulated in, in a lot of ways by people who stood, right. who used it to make money. And, um, and, you know, and it's not to me, like, you know the totality of it is what's interesting right and the, yes. the, the the paradoxes that happened in those relationships right yeah um that you know that went on to affect all of us in the culture and and you know everything since then right yeah that's great right. um, yeah, but I'm, I'm grateful to, to continue to share and you know all these moments that have captured it and, and it's all on film so it's it's everything's a process of digitizing and getting a scan and then cleaning it up and then writing against it but the fact that there's more to share with people makes me you know happy each day to go through my files and find you know random moments you know i just got a batch of fuji stuff you know back and you know within it uh there's a picture from 1997 with fat joe on the set with wyclef and Celia cruz on the guantana meta video you know and there's oh, nice. other there's just so many fun moments of you know of moments where people are just together just to hang out and support each other you know and, and i love that i think one of the rarest things i've found recently he was probably the first person I'm sharing with on camera. Um, it was, um, I think it might've been 97. It was when Will Smith did the record for Men in Black soundtrack or whatever. On the same soundtrack, Destiny's Ch Ch Child uh, is on the soundtrack. And that day at the record store, uh, Yvette uh, Shore, their publicist at the time, had me take a group shot of Destiny Ch Justice Children you know, together by a, a piano. And then she also had me said, remember she said, this is the lead singer. And it didn't click at the time. Mm -hmm. And she had stood her like right by grand piano. So you have this almost virgin-esque uh, image of Beyonce by grand piano, you know, at the start of her career. So I'm just like, oh, fuck, I, I didn't even know she was, I forgot. But it's just like, I have more to share with people, you know, and I, I'm grateful for that. And you get people literally at the start of their careers. And now she's goddess plus plus. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, and, and it reminds me, you know, I used to throw clubs in the 90s and we would never think to have a photographer there. Either somebody brought a camera or they didn't, you know, but, right. um, you know, we had like Mac McDaniel would show up sometimes and take some pictures. But like, right. we never thought about that. You know what I mean? We didn't think that, tw you know, 20 or 40 years later, we're going to really want these photos and we should totally. document those. And, and we actually had Destiny's Child. They were, you know, they opened for somebody, Busta or I forget who, and I'm sure they right. get paid. And, uh, you know, we misspelled their name on the flyer. Like it was such an afterthought, right? Um, but that's I've, one I've of those moments I've that, you know, yeah, I mean, it's great. It's great. Some, you know, it, in some ways, like it's also exciting that that just lives in a memory and there is no, yes. you know, real record of it. Um, but at the same time, you know, those moments get lost and you don't get to tell those stories right. uh, ongoing. So, you know, I'm glad that that you and, and you know, other people are, are really capturing uh, the evolution as it happens. Yeah, um, I'm, gr I'm grateful for it. I'm grateful. It's like with skateboarding, sure. it's like you just you go through a, a time period and you're just documenting as you're going along. Not necessarily to sell it per se, but you're just happy to document it and share it with your friends, document it. Right. That's, that's where the passion comes from and the artistry comes uh, as, a, as a result of your passion, you know, and, and that's what I've learned to appreciate over time and being able to share it, uh, you know, moments from, you know, late 80s, early 90s or early 2000s, you know, it just, time goes by so fast after a while. You're just like, fuck, we did all that? Okay, let's yeah. keep going. Definitely. Uh, well, let me do a quick lightning round before I let you go. Uh, what's your favorite city to travel to? What's again? Favorite city to travel to? St. Louis. Okay. Yeah. I used to go out there a lot when the sign music tours and it's a simple, small city, but there's so much uh, culture and art, oddly enough, that's all for free. And a lot of people that live there don't, can't, don't take advantage of it, but I saw it as like a mini New York. That's so easy to understand and, and uh, get through the city. And I still love the city. I finally went back there. Uh, I think it was two years ago and the city was exactly the same and I'm still stoked on the city. Interesting. I've never heard about an art scene there. That's that's great. Yeah, it's beautiful. That's, that's a cool find. Nice. 
Um, who's your favorite DJ? My favorite DJ. Um, hmm. I don't know that I have a favorite DJ. I'm trying to think. I'll come back to it. Uh, person. Oh, person. I, I know who my favorite DJ is. Uh, Evil D from the Beat Miners. Duh. Sorry. Okay. Because <laughs> he plays such great music. That's just. Like I could hear it, like it's, he doesn't just play hip hop, he plays music yeah. that just, he knows how to fill a room with happiness. Yeah, yeah, I've seen him live a couple of times, that's, that's yeah. dope. Um, what is, a, other than your own, what's the last great book you've read or listened to? Uh, hmm. Wait, actually that's a look. Uh, I don't remember. Um, after because I go through books and then I start them and I drop them. It, yeah, I, right. Actually, I knew the books are. One second. Actually, two two books. Duh. Okay. I didn't finish reading, but uh, this was both gifted to me uh, through the Looking Glass, the original oh, one. No. Yeah. And then uh, Passages. Oh, nice. Yeah. So I okay. got both of these at uh, Sweet Pickle Bookstore uh, in the Lower East Side. Shout out Dope. Sweet Pickle Books. Nice. Um, Stay. Word. What movie do you think you've seen the most in your life? Either Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory or Fifth Element. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting combination. <laughs> um, who, I mean, those are both great movies. So that's, that's time well spent. Um, who's something, who's someone you've learned a lot from that you haven't met? Hmm. <clears throat> I have to think about that one. That's, I was gonna say VMix, but that's a new relationship. So that doesn't really count. Um, duh, okay, here we go. Um, Grant Pertain, the photographer, the skateboard photographer, just because of the way that he's photographed, you know, skateboarding throughout history. Um, it's the way that I've studied his pictures, like not consciously, but uh, consciously of how he lights it, um, he always, uh, also Tiva Jefferson, but more so Grant Pertain, um, just providing a scope of how to see a person uh, in a non-traditional sense doing a trick and being able to have enough elements within the picture to tell the story of what the, the person is doing on the board. So that, mm -hmm. that definitely helped train my eye um, over the years and nonstop. Um, and even imitating in so many ways. Uh, I remember like early on in photography, like I didn't have much money as a professional photographer. So the widest, angle lens that I had at one point was like a 28 millimeter lens, but you can create certain distortions to almost get fisheye effects, depending on how you just slightly tilt your camera back and forth to give you more depth of field or wider space to shoot from. Oh, uh, that's cool. Yeah. Love that. Okay. Last one. If I worked for you or we worked together, what's something I would hear you say over and over? Hmm. Either something simple like no worries or uh, we can figure this out. It'll be easy. You know, I don't care what it is. Um, just because it's almost like um, somebody joked it's back at me. I had to get some uh, special boards printed like within a three-day turnaround and it's in the middle of the pandemic. And someone said to me, oh, you can't get it done. You can't. And I'm like, I'm from Jersey. You can't tell me I can't get it done. And I got it done. You know what I mean? Like, I just need a few options to figure out how to make it happen. I don't want to hear sure. that something can't be done. Like, there's always, there's always a, a, um, a peaceful solution to any problem. Like, honestly, you just have to be calm about approaching it. I love that. That's a great, that's a great way to go through life. Yes. I love it. Well, dude, thank you so much for spending this time with me, man. It's great. I appreciate all the stories. Um, yeah, I definitely I'm want honored. To Everybody should check out Rare and Unseen Moments of 90s Hip Hop. Pick up a copy. Looks Thank like you. that gold one is is uh, is calling out. So 
You should grab a, grab a copy of that while you can. And only a few we'll, left. There's only it. hundred made. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, oh, well, I just want to shout out. I've gone through your pages. It's, it's interesting. Um, a whole segment of my life that I, I don't. I sort of skip through. Um, where I used when I ran an amateur skateboard league from 1998 to 2005. During that time period, I had my office in Echo Limited's building. Um, mm. And there's someone who worked at Echo for a short period that you had interviewed, uh, James Andrews. And oh, yeah. I knew yeah, I knew James um, first a little bit from the music industry, but then he came to do marketing at Zoo, at, at Echo okay. for a, a okay. period of time. And then he went on to do internet related stuff. But it was just interesting. I'm like, oh, yeah, he's a part of my backstory history and so many different you know areas of life that we've trickled through. You know, and I remember yeah. when he did the Internet stuff, the first company that he worked for, uh, we had actually pitched. Um, it wasn't called Jackass yet, but we were pitching something similar to Jackass, and they just thought it was too much. And I'm like, dude, you sure. don't understand what this is. Like, this is gonna be gold. You're like, oh, you're crazy. I'm like, all right, now look at Rob Deerdeck. <laughs> I mean, look at how they're, they're coming out with a movie now. You know, 30, that's what I'm saying. Like, we, later, knew, we, like we knew, we knew, we knew, we had it. We knew we had lightning in a bottle. So, but that's yeah, crazy. it's just always something fun. And, and that's again, dope. trust in your gut that you know that this is right. Yeah. Love it, man. Well, uh, can't wait to meet you when you're out here for the show. Definitely. And I'll definitely be watching uh, everything else you're up to. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I truly appreciate it. Dave Cove, thank you again for, for the connection. Yeah, yeah. Shout out Dave Cove. Yeah, that was T. Eric Monroe on Rebel Radio. I hope you enjoyed it. I know I did. Uh, make sure you check out his website. Buy a book. Buy some NFTs. Follow him on Instagram, whatever it is. Uh, and most importantly, come back next week for more Rebel Radio. Peace.